Thank you all for uh, being here. Um, so I will indeed try to tell you about gravitational wave detectors and how quantum mechanics plays a role in it. Um, I do want to point out a few things on my opening slide. Uh, the very first is that even though I sort of vainly put my name up here, I actually am the messenger for the work of very, very many people. It's the, the entities involved are the LIGO Laboratory and the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. And of course, almost everything I'll tell you about is funded by the National Science Foundation. So let me say, if you don't like what I say, blame Beverly. She funds me. <laughs> <laughs> so... What I'm going to tell you about are two revolutions. And Beverly already told you what those two revolutions are, are, are likely to be. So gravitational waves are a new way to look at the universe. And I'm going to tell you about, about gravitational waves and how we do that. Gravitational wave detectors are the most sensitive position meters ever constructed. Now, once you construct something that has such exquisite uh, sensitivity, you must confront quantum mechanics. This is really the, 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 the way that these two uh, uh, ideas of staring out into the universe to, and contemplating what it might look like at, with gravitational waves and then asking what is the role of quantum mechanics in, in that. So gravitational wave detectors, I will try to show you by the end of my talk, are also, not only are they going to show us all these wonderful unknown things about the universe, but they're also fantastic new tools uh, for studying quantum mechanics in truly macroscopic, sort of human scale objects. All right, so here is the roadmap of what my uh, talk is going to uh, c cover. Uh, I'll start, it's in three parts basically. I'll start with gravitational waves and astrophysics. So, why should we, what are gravitational waves and why is it interesting to do astrophysics with them? Then I'll tell you a little bit about gravitational wave detectors. How do we go about detecting these gravitational waves? And then finally, I will, uh, in, in the last third of my talk, I'll tell you about the limits imposed by quantum mechanics and how we manipulate those. So, gravitational waves and the violent universe. So, you'll see in a moment why gravitational waves are most interesting when the universe is violent, but here is our universe in one quick view graph. So, we start right here at at the present uh, uh, time, and time is moving backwards as we go uh, back towards the, this uh, blue-green patch here, which is representative of the uh, cosmic microwave background. So as we look out backwards in, in time, we see uh, our galaxy, the one we inhabit, the Milky Way, and then we see galaxies nearby, and then we see clusters of galaxies, large collections of galaxies, um, uh, that are very loosely gravitationally bound. And as we go further back in time, we hit this uh, observational wall, if you will, called the cosmic microwave background. So uh, what's happening here is that if you imagine this artist's rendition of the Big Bang, something like 400,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, light or photons could escape from the hot soup of, of, of matter and reach us as observers, so 13 billion years later. So the universe is about 13 and a half billion years old. We can only look at, at the, the, the origins about 400,000 years after the very earliest um, uh, times associated with the Big Bang. Now, as we look at this rich universe out there with all kinds of variety of stars and all the, all the uh, processes of the births and deaths of stars, all of this information has been brought to us by, I shouldn't say all, most of this information has been brought to us by one very, very important messenger, and it's light. So we point our various uh, telescopes to, into the skies, and we collect photons which carry information about the, the, uh, the sources from which they originate. And that, uh, here I show a, a, a variety of telescopes. Some of them are optical. Some of them are gamma ray, infrared, uh, and even x-ray. And so these are all telescopes where different colors of light are telling us about the underlying processes that are going on in the universe around us. And what I want to talk to you about today is that every time we uh, ex explorers have, have looked at the universe in a different color of light, 
they have seen a very different universe. So this is one of my favorite uh, uh, pictures here. This is the visible universe as it was um, uh, uh, known in 1957. This is drawn by, hand drawn by a draftsman. A draftsman just collected all the known locations of stars and galactic coordinates and drew this. And you can see it's dominated by uh, uh, objects along uh, our galactic plane. And then with the infrared, with cosmic microwave background, also infrared, gamma ray bursts were found to have to be uh, spatially homogeneous. They're, they're found in all directions, anywhere you look. And what I'd like to propose to you today is that we are asking the question of what will the sky look like when you observe it with this new messenger, which is a gravitational wave. And so I'm going to tell you more about that. One way that you can think about this is it's, if you could do astrophysics with a gravitational wave, it's like turning on a new sense. So you've had eyes all along, and now suddenly maybe you have ears. You turn on hearing. So it's, it's bound to provide some very, very different information. So what are these gravitational waves? Well, we have to begin a little bit by understanding gravity. So in the 16th century, Newton had a very, very successful uh, theory of gravity. There was the universal law of gravitation, and ba the basic idea, which New Newton could actually quantify, was that if you had a massive object of mass m1 and uh, a distance r away, you had a massive object uh, of mass m2, you could b write down the force between those two objects, and it scaled as 1 over the distance between them squared. But, and this was very successful. It, 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 was, it, was, it predicted planetary motion and, 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 um, and as it was known at the time. Now, Newton worried about a problem, which was the problem of action at a distance. And actually, he wasn't the first to worry about this. Aristotle even had worried about it. And the, he worried about this question of, well, how is it that these two the objects uh, are able to influence each other when they're, when they're, they're far apart? And in, uh, for, for this, this question in gravity, our next hero was Einstein in the 20th century. And Einstein actually gave us a, 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 a simple way to get around the action at a distance problem. He gave us some ways to get around many other problems, too. But um, what it was, what, he's, what Einstein's picture of gravity was, he was like, forget about forces and forces at, at, and, and acting at, uh, uh, at uh, great distances uh, between objects. Think of all of space-time uh, as, a, as a fabric. And when you place a massive object on this fabric, it distorts it or it warps the space-time. So, uh, Einstein's picture was essentially that when you have a massive object, it changes the, the curvature of the space-time. And then if you have another massive object nearby, it has to follow that curvature. So a very um, uh, uh, nice way to think about this is if you imagine um, the surface of a cushion. And you place a bowling ball in the center of it. So it deforms, it curves, uh, in, uh, makes a depression where the bowling ball is. Now if you take a little playing marble and you place it at the edge of the, of the cushion, the playing marble will follow the curvature of the cushion and fall in or be attracted to the bowling ball. And similarly, if you actually give the playing marble some velocity, uh, it will actually orbit uh, the, uh, the bowling ball because of the curvature that it's made. Now, that's the static part of Einstein's gravity. That's what happens when, when you have massive object, it sort of sits around. Now, what happens if you actually uh, cause this massive object to, uh, uh, to accelerate? And if you could take your bowling ball and, and, and bounce it up and down. Now what would happen is on the surface of your cushion, uh, uh, ripples would emanate from the bouncing uh, b bowling ball. The whole surface would ripple out. And if you had a playing marble, it would bob. It would feel the, the effects of those ripples. And that, in fact, is what Einstein um, uh, uh, predicted in the form of a gravitational wave. So when the massive object vibrates, the ripples of space-time that propagate outward from it are the gravitational wave. Okay. So there are a few prop properties of gravitational waves that are are, uh, are uh, important for our purposes. There are many more that I won't talk about. So I already said they are a prediction of, of Einstein's general theory of relativity. They are ripples of the space-time uh, itself. And in general relativity, they travel at the speed of light.
Okay? Now, for our purposes, a very important property of those gravitational waves is that as they propagate out from the source, uh, they stretch and squeeze the spacetime transfers to their direction of propagation. So if a gravitational wave is propagating outwards like this, it's actually squeezing and stretching the spacetime as it propagates outwards. And this is going to be an important property when we think about how to detect them. Uh, the gravitational wave amplitude is usually represented uh, as a quantity h, and it's called a strain because it corresponds to a change in length per length. It's, it's, it's similar to a tidal force. So here is a gravitational wave propagating normal to the screen, and as it, it travels by at, at, at the each half period of the gravitational wave, the spacetime stretches and shrinks in, in um, uh, orthogonal directions. As, as you can see, and the amount by which it stretches and shrinks is proportional to the distance between these uh, objects. If you think of these red objects as little particles, the space time between the particles stretches and, and shrinks, and the amount by which it does that is proportional to the, the original distance between them. So this is like a tidal force. Now, gravitational waves are emitted by accelerating masses, and I have to add one little twist to that, which I won't say much more about, but it's, it's important, which is that it's, it's, they're emitted by accelerating mass distributions that are aspherical. If you have a completely spherical mass distribution, it won't radiate, and that's it's to do with I ideas of conservation of energy and momentum, and so the lowest order in which the radiation occurs is quadrupolar, okay? And so, all right. What are the astrophysical sources of gravitational waves that we might, uh, uh, we might uh, uh, imagine? So the ingredients you need to make a gravitational wave are lots of mass, such as uh, so very compact, dense stars, like neutron stars or black holes. You need rapid accelerations, so orbits and, and, and explosions and, and collisions are, are, are um, a good, a good ways to generate these gravitational waves. Uh, colliding <coughs> uh, stars, so when you have mergers of, of stars that are orbiting each other. Supernovae, stars that, that, that burn all their, their central nuclear engine and then implode on themselves and then shed a, a layer of material. Uh, the, that accelerating material can be, um, um, uh, uh, will generate a gravitational wave. And of course, as I already mentioned, <coughs> the Big Bang itself, which allows us to to look farther back in time than <coughs> we can with photons, and I'll tell you in a moment why. So here's what we might expect the universe to look like if we could do it astrophysics with gravitational waves instead of light. How do we make light? We accelerate charge. How do we make gravitational waves? We accelerate aspherical mass distributions. What do objects look like when we view them with light? Well, we get images, we get pretty pictures because the wavelength of the light is much, much smaller than the <coughs> size of the object that we're observing. Now, in the case of gravitational waves, we don't actually get images because the wavelength of these gravitational waves can be very, very, very long, many hundreds of kilometers. But in fact, what we get are waveforms. So, what typically the way that we would look for a gravitational wave is we would have time on this <coughs> axis here and amplitude or the strength of the, of the gravitational wave signal here and you would uh, make a, a waveform out of this. And <coughs> if you encode this into, uh, into an electrical signal and put it on a loudspeaker, it actually makes a very pretty sound. So it, you, you, instead of imaging, you would get um, uh, a time information. Now, why is it that gravitational wave astrophysics can be so much more, um, um, can give us so, uh, so much more information about that very early universe? Well, it turns out photons are extremely friendly characters. They're absorbed, they're scattered, they're dispersed by matter. Every time they meet matter, they want to interact. Now, gravitational waves, on the other hand, are extremely aloof. They meet matter, they go right through it. So if you're an <coughs> astrophysicist and you're trying to detect things in the distance universe, uh, this is actually a very useful property because the gravitational wave arrives at you, the observer, from the source quite undisturbed. And, and this, of course, is a very double-edged sword because this very property that makes the gravitational wave not interact with matter that could be between us and the source also makes it interact very weakly with our detector. 
So well, this is going to make the business of detecting a little bit challenging. All right, now when you think about the, the frequency of, 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 of light waves, you think about radio waves which start at 100 megahertz and then higher. So radio waves all the way up to <coughs> gamma rays. Now in the case of gravitational waves, most sources that people are actively thinking about have, have frequencies that are about 10 kilohertz and lower. And this is another way to think about why gravitational waves are, are thought of as, as the ears into the universe. Because you, if you notice, this is uh, more or less uh, audio band and lower, into the edge of the human audio band and lower. <coughs> All right. So should we believe that gravitational waves are really out there? Einstein told us about them in 19... Uh, in the period between 1916 and 1918. Einstein himself was very morose when he first made the calculation of, of, of gravitational waves because you'll see in a, in a moment they're quite weak. So here is the evidence. And the evidence for the gravitational wave comes from uh, a, a different um, area of astrophysics, uh, which is uh, radio astronomy, where Hulse and Taylor looked at a binary neutron star system. They basically looked at a pulsar. And a pulsar is a, a very, very dense, massive star which has an extremely strong magnetic field. And that magnetic field causes the radiation, the electromagnetic radiation, the light from the, the, the pulsar to be heavily beamed. So you can think of the pulsar as a, a, a lighthouse, as a cosmic lighthouse. So every time the, the beam passes your line of sight, you get a pulse of light. And they're also known to be very, very, have a very precise uh, period. So it's a very well-timed uh, um, clock. So what Hulse and Taylor noticed in this particular system uh, of uh, uh, PSR 1913 plus 16 was that this, the, the regularity with which this, this lighthouse beam uh, was arriving at their, at their radio telescope, which was done, by the way, at Arecibo, which many people know from from things other than uh, uh, radio astronomy, they found that the timing of these, uh, these uh, pulses that were coming from the pulsar changed on a, on a, on a roughly eight-hour uh, period. And they associated that with uh, loss of energy of, the, of this orbiting binary. So here's what was going on. You have two stars. They're orbiting each other. And as they orbit each other, because of the very strong gravity of, of these, these pulsars, you get the, these neutron stars or pulsars have about the mass of the sun, but packed into a 10 kilometer radius. So it's the size of a small city, but our whole sun's crunched in there. It's pretty dense, uh, quite a strong uh, gravitationally uh, bound system. And so as these objects are, are uh, orbiting each other, they're losing energy to gravitational radiation. And as they lose energy to gravitational radiation, their orbits are getting closer to each other. They're, and that was, in fact, what they measured right here. On the vertical axis was the change in orbital period. And on the horizontal axis here is just time. Their measurements span from 1975 to 2005. Okay? And these were their data points for, for this change in, 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 in orbital period. And the black line, it's not a fit. It's exact prediction uh, of general relativity for what would be uh, what would happen if it was gravitational wave emission. So this is widely accepted as, uh, as evidence that gravitational waves are out there and in fact it led to a Nobel Prize for Hulse and Taylor in 1993. Now comes the, the saddest part of all. So here is that same Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar at the end of its lifetime, which would be about 100 million years from now for that particular pulsar. Now, it's the only equation I have, I think, in the whole, in the whole uh, talk, but I'll just point out one or two things. Here is our gravitational wave amplitude right here, the strain H. And <coughs> notice here that we have gravitational constant G in the numer numerator. We have speed of light to the fourth power in the denominator, and R, which is the distance from the source to us as observers in the denominator. Now, those two numbers put together, speed of <coughs> light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second to the fourth power. This is not going to be a very happy or big number. Okay? And in fact, when we plug in the, the values for the Hulse-Taylor binary, we find <coughs> at the distance that it is, which is about 21,000 light years from us, it had a strain of uh, a part in 10 to the minus 18. 
Now, if you took that same binary and put it in the Virgo cluster, which is the next cluster of galaxies closest to us, so it's a nice benchmark for a place where there are a lot of these systems that one might look for, then the number goes down to uh, 10 to the minus 21. Now, is anyone dismayed to see this number? Yeah. So one shouldn't be dismayed as yet. It's a dimensionless number. I always tell my students that there's no dimensions. How, what, you know, how would we know what, what scale to put on it? But we're going to put a scale on it soon. So here comes the second part of my talk, which is gravitational wave detectors. How do we go about detecting these gravitational waves? So it turns out that if we recall the property, the one property of gravitational waves that I highlighted, which was that they shrink and stretch the space-time transfers to their direction of motion, then a laser interferometer is a very useful device uh, to detect them. Now, the way the laser interferometer works is there's a, a laser, and the light from this, this laser is split on this, this half-silvered mirror, or beam splitter. Half the light goes up towards this mirror here. The other half of the light goes up it goes through the beam splitter towards this mirror here. The light gets reflected from both and interferes on the beam splitter. And we can measure that interference pattern on a photo detector here. Now, we can arrange this so that the path lengths, the, the distance from the beam splitter to this mirror and, that, the, and, the one, and to the other mirror are equal. And we can arrange it so that no light should come out here. We have perfect destructive interference. Then along comes a gravitational wave from space. And if it were transverse to, to this, this, uh, the plane of this interferometer, then indeed the interferometer would, would stretch and shrink um, uh, along the two uh, orthogonal arms. This change in, in path length uh, we could measure as part of our interference pattern. You can think of it as the light takes a longer time in this arm than in this arm, and we can measure that, that difference in time, uh, uh, light travel time on this detector here. And now comes the, the the part where we uh, start to put a scale on this. So if you build a, a laboratory scale uh, interferometer like this, you can imagine a laboratory scale interferometer could be about a meter long or so. That's an un a reasonable uh, size thing on an optical table. And now if you recall, we had our strain was a, a, a part in 10 to the 21 times the, 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 the length of our detector is a meter. And we have this terrible, terrible, terrible task of measuring a change in distance of 10 to the minus 21 meters. So if this is the point to sit up, we just say, this is crazy. You cannot do this. And I would agree with you. So what we do is we make our detectors a little bit longer than a meter. So here is an aerial view of the LIGO detectors. LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And in the case of LIGO, this is a four kilometer long detector. And here is the L shape of the interferometer, like I showed on the schematic. And once you make the detector uh, four kilometers long, you have a much, much simpler task of measuring uh, displacements of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So now we feel better, and we're ready to <laughs> proceed. OK, so I just want to point out LIGO the LIGO detectors are, there are two LIGO um, uh, detectors, one in um, uh, uh, Washington State east of Louisiana, recognized by being a, a desert landscape, and the other one, uh, 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 oh, sorry, it was Washington State east of Seattle, <laughs> thank you, and the other detector is in Louisiana, sort of halfway between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and you can recognize that it's in the middle of a pine forest. There are other detectors that, that populate the planet. The next largest one is the Virgo detector in Italy. It's an Ita Italian-French collaboration, and that is three kilometers long. And then a 600-meter-long detector in Germany, a British-German collaboration. <coughs> and a um, future space detector um, known as LISA. Uh, many of you are, are familiar with, with, may be familiar with that. LISA is a NASA uh, ESA mission, and LISA has arm lengths of uh, 5 million kilometers. So real estate in space is cheap, so you can do that. All right, so now let's recap. Here is measurement in the real world. How do we measure gravitational waves? We measure them by measuring displacements of mirrors of our interferometer. And to do that, we must measure the phase shifts of the light. So we have, if you are making one of these uh, at, at home or, or in, in your labs uh, this week, 
there's only two things you need to watch out for. So what makes it hard? Well, the gravitational wave amplitude is small, and that we can't do much about. That's what, that's what uh, nature has given us. And the other two things you have to watch out for as an experimenter designing the experiment is external forces want to push these mirrors around much, much more than a gravitational wave can push them around. So you want to shield your, your, your mirrors from external forces. And then the other thing is your light, your laser light is your meter stick. So you want to make it a very me uh, stable meter stick. You have to make sure that the fluctuations of the, of, the, of the light are as small as possible. And yet we'll see soon have to be s as small as the quantum limit will allow. Okay? All right, so here is a, a detector at, at in one quick glance. So here is our laser. There is the beam splitter that, we, uh, that I already introduced. And then four kilometers away is a mirror here, another mirror there. The light reflects and comes back to this photo detector where we make the measurement. And the only other little tricky thing that I've added in here is I have another mirror in here, and this mirror faces the, the mirror that's four kilometers away, and it's very close to the beam splitter. And these, this pair of mirrors and this pair of mirrors forms optical cavities. And let me just tell you, optical cavities are, are, are quite simple to understand. You've all, at some point or the other, stuck your head between two mirrors, and you see multiple reflections. So what, this cav what these cavities do is they basically, this, these mirrors facing each other, uh, uh, trap <coughs> the laser light and build up the power of the laser. So the laser light bounces multiple times in here, and that increases our sensitivity uh, to the gravitational wave signal or to the displacement of the mirror in general. And now there's one other thing that I'll point out on this view graph that you might notice. The mirrors look a little goofy. They kind of look like they're hanging from wires up as pendulums. And the uh, reason is they do. Yeah, we do some goofy things, and that's one of them. Now, the reason for that is very is twofold. The one is that above the, the resonant frequency of this pendulum, the, the uh, forces that act on, the, on the, the suspension point of the wires do not transmit down to the mirror. So it's a way of filtering out the ground noise. So it's a way of shielding your mirror from, uh, from all the motion of the ground that shakes around the suspension point. And then, of course, if above the resonant frequency uh, of, the, of this pendulum, the mirror is a free particle. So you can think of it this way. Once you get above the resonant frequency of the, of the, of the pendulum, which is around a hertz for us, you can treat the mirror as a free-floating inertial object. Okay? So that's the reason we do that. Now, here is a tour of LIGO. This is our Louisiana Observatory. You can see the pine forest here. I already showed you uh, the uh, central building. And then going out four kilometers to, to this end and to another end we can't see here are our, our vacuum tubes. In, uh, the laser beams are run inside of these vacuum tubes. You can see here are the stainless steel tubes. And here is, um, is the housing for, uh, uh, for uh, the uh, vacuum tube. And I'm, I'm told there was a big scramble to get these, uh, these housings um, uh, completed before hunting season. So if anyone's wondering why they, they're, they're around, they have many purposes. Um, you can see that they have other purposes too. This is not a Photoshop uh, picture. This is a real thing. This is now at the Hanford Observatory. So they're very important. Uh, you go inside of these, the central building, you see, um, you see uh, um, big metal cans like this. And to put a scale on them, if I were to stand beside one, my head reaches just below uh, uh, this row of viewports. And inside each of these chambers lives a mirror of the uh, interferometer. But it doesn't just live in there. It has a few other uh, 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 exciting things done to it. This is a system of springs and masses, and springs and masses quite similar to the shock absorbers in your car. This is a, a passive vibration isolation system, so to further shield the mirrors from ground vibrations. And on top of this vibration isolation stack um, sits, I won't tell you, but a, a tower like this. And inside of this tower, what you can see are the suspension wires. And there's this a mirror that's about 25 centimeters in diameter that's hanging as a pendulum. And this is a, a zoom in of the, of the mirror for, uh, for uh, glass buffs. And here's what you can do when you put this all together. When you put this all together, you can you make a detector with this sensitivity. So let me introduce this, this uh, uh, graph a little bit. 
So on the horizontal axis, we have frequency. And the frequency goes from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz, so human audio band, just to, uh, for reference. And on the vertical axis, we have the, the uh, spectral density of strain. You can just think of it as uh, a st uh, the strain in, 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 uh, per bandwidth. And the blue curve is the design uh, that the, uh, the founding mothers and fathers actually wrote down almost 30 years ago. And then the yellow curve is the, the sensitivity with which the first uh, phase of LIGO, called initial LIGO, uh, operated in the 2005 to 2007 uh, period. Um, okay, and uh, I'll. So if you were to detect a gravitational wave, you would need a gravitational wave that whose frequency uh, uh, was such that it was in a, an amplitude was such that it was in this region here. Any gravitational wave that whose strength is below this uh, blue line, we couldn't see. So, with the first generation of LIGO detectors, there has been uh, over 50 published results. Uh, in, in, uh, on a variety of topics from neutron stars to gamma rays to, to pulsars to um, um, the, the cosmological uh, background from the early universe. But the important thing to, to uh, message to take away is there have not yet been any positive detections. And this brings us to the next generation of LIGO. And this is called Advanced LIGO, which has just begun construction. The whole motivation for building advanced LIGO is that if you could make a detector that's more sensitive, your sensitivity to, uh, 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 to uh, strain, because this is an amplitude detector, your, your, the di it, it goes linearly with the distance. And therefore, if you could make a detector that was twice as sensitive, you actually can, the, the, the volume that you can probe is two cubed, so eight times more, uh, more volume of the universe. So there's a lot of motivation uh, to build a more sensitive detector. And so the, I, the advanced LIGO, what it has targeted to do is to build a detector that's 10 times more sensitive than initial LIGO. And that would give us an event rate that's about uh, 10 cubed more, uh, more frequent. So we know we want this to build this detector for astrophysical reasons. And so now let me show you what our, our, um, what trouble we're going to come up against. So here is a fundamental question. We use light to me measure the position of a particle. You can actually forget about LIGO for this. This is actually true in any, any system you could think of. We use light to, to uh, measure the position uh, of the particle. But the light, which is photons, carry momentum. And that momentum can be transferred to the particle on which you're trying to make the measurement. And the uh, momentum fluctuations of that light, light cause the particle uh, to give the particle unknown kicks. And so how can we know the position of the particle where our very attempt to measure it is kicking it? This is the question. So what I want to do now is to, to show you that LIGO, advanced LIGO, is confronting this limit. This is sometimes known as the standard quantum limit, which is um, how do I make a measurement of a particle uh, uh, position with light uh, when the light will disturb the measurement I'm trying to make? Okay. So here is the, the story with advanced LIGO. You're a little bit used to seeing pictures like this now. So again, 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz in frequency on the horizontal axis and strain um, uh, per bandwidth on the uh, vertical axis. And here now is that, I that initial LIGO curve and uh, and a, a couple of experimental curves where LIGO has operated. And then the black curve is the design curve for advanced LIGO. And the way that we get to some of this, I won't tell you about all the design improvements, but one of the big design improvements in this region here is that we have a more powerful laser. So if you ask what was the limiting noise in this region here, above about 150 hertz for LIGO, it was the quantum fluctuations on the light. So what is this? Uh, this basically is that photons, <coughs> darn things, come as discrete particles. And so when you are counting, when you make a measurement uh, uh, where you're counting the number of photons, you are limited by, uh, uh, by an uncertainty that goes as the square root of the number of photons. So your signal scales as the number of photons, 
but your noise, this uncertainty, scales as the square root of the number of photons. So your signal-to-noise ratio is, impro uh, is improved if you, by the square root of the number of photons you use in your measurement. And so more photons, more powerful laser, and this curve dropped down. And now comes the, the, uh, that, the, that, quant that standard quantum limit issue that I talked about. So certainly, you can have more photons. But now what happens is in this region of the curve, those larger number of photons and the fluctuations on those photons are kicking your mirror more. So you have the, a, 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 a fundamental conundrum of, of quantum measurement which is that you turned up your laser power, so you made a stronger measurement. You measured more precisely, uh, you think, the position of your particle. But quantum mechanics says that when you do that, you must also have a stronger back action. Your measurement apparatus kicks back on the object being measured. And this is known as radiation <coughs> pressure noise. So the same fluctuating number of photons are carrying fluctuating momentum, and that's kicking your mirror. Okay? That is the 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 problem we set out to solve in LIGO and this little in it for advanced LIGO and beyond and this dashed line here so <coughs> marks the locus of points that that corresponds to the standard quantum limit so you can just think of this this uh, this is the line at which for every laser power you could you would have this this balance between making a stronger measurement and getting more back action okay so there's a, this is the those are the two competing forces so where does this come from? It comes from quantum uncertainty. So let me just introduce for a moment what I mean by that. If you take a beam of light, in the classical world, if you just uh, plot amplitude versus time, this would just be a perfect thin line, you know, infinitely thin uh, line sine wave. Okay. Now, in the quantum world, you are always, you always are left with, you have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So you always have some uncertainty. And in this particular case, what I've drawn is a, 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 a sine wave where you have equal uncertainty in the amplitude. So you notice that, that the, 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 the width of the line, the fuzziness of the line, and you, and you have equal uncertainty in the phase, which is the zero crossings. You don't know if the line crossed the, uh, zero here or here. It could have crossed zero anywhere within this gray box. So that's a representative of the phase uncertainty and the amplitude is representative of the energy uncertainty. So we've all learned in, 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 in quantum mechanics, energy time and time form uh, um, a, um, the, the product of those uncertainties must be uh, uh, greater than one in uh, normalized units. And so that's what, and this is what a quantum limited laser beam looks like, really. It just, it, it's not a, you, you, you have some uncertainty in its amplitude and phase at the quantum level. I'm going to introduce one other concept here that comes from quantum optics, uh, and that is that if you can, you can make laboratory apparatuses that will make a light uh, beam that looks like this. So notice what happened here. Over here, what I did was we have increased the uncertainty in amplitude, but we have made the uncertainty in phase very, very uh, uh, small. And the product of the two is still uh, uh, does not exceed h bar, so Heisenberg is in no way uh, being uh, should no way be upset by what we're doing. Okay, Heisenberg uncertainty principle is preserved. What we're doing is we're just shuffling the uncertainty from one variable to the other, and this is a very important thing because if we can make a measurement where we only measure phase, we're only measuring these zero crossings and collecting no information about the amplitude. We can make a better measurement than this one here. See, this circle here is certainly larger than this circle here. All right? And that's what we're going to do. Now, why is this important for an interferometer? Well, here's a thought experiment, and a, a, a fun one. Maybe you'll participate with me in this. So here is an ideal interferometer, a laser, a perfect beam splitter, sends half the light to this mirror and half the light to this mirror. We've arranged these path lengths so that they that the light perfectly destructively interferes at this output here. What would my detector, a detector placed at this output measure? The perfect interferometer, perfect destructive interference here. That means perfect constructive interference going this way. All the laser light goes back this way. What do you think we might measure here? Dot noise. 
short noise. So the experts have answered. So if you, if you were, would allow me to trick you, you would have said, oh, of course, a perfect zero. And no. Now, how is this possible? I've already told you so that ideal interferometer. If there's noise on the laser, it better go back right with the laser. So this is where the, the formulation that was introduced to in the early 1980s by Carl Caves is very important. In a quantum system, when you have an open port, which is what this beam splitter is going in this way, this is, a, this is an open port, the vacuum fluctuations, just the popcorn that we live in, the popcorn of the noise of the electromagnetic field that, we, that we're surrounded by, enters in here. And look what I've done. I've made a little fuzzball. It says it has equal uncertainty in amplitude and phase. And my fuzzball goes into the interferometer, reflects off these mirrors, and comes right back out. <coughs> And if you think of this yellow ve um, vector as my signal, it fuzzes out my signal. That's shot noise. So the shot noise comes because of this open port of the interferometer here. If I could then take that specially prepared uh, squeeze light that I talked about, the one where I have put some of, uh, <laughs> I have reduced the uncertainty in one direction and increased it in the other direction into this interferometer then you can notice right away I can make a better measurement, uh, a, a better signal to noise ratio measurement here. Now I have to be very careful. As long as my signal phaser is along this uh, direction where I have the narrowest part of the ellipse, I'm making a better measurement. But I dare not have my phaser start to, to get misaligned because then I'll pick up all of this extra noise along the long part of the ellipse. Okay? And that's basically the principle of, of uh, quantum enhancement in in, um, in interferometers. I wanted to make one other point. Radiation pressure noise that I talked about is exactly the same phenomenon. It's this, this electromagnetic field, the fluctuations that come in here that are applying, uh, 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 that, that uh, push around the mirror um, uh, and cause a mirror displacement. All right. So we use some techniques of quantum mechanics. I've put a big black box around the actual squeeze state generator because I don't want to talk too much about how it's done. Um, you can make a squeeze state source. You can take that source and inject it into your interferometer, as we do here. And then when you make a measurement, you can indeed notice that you can make a measurement that is better than the, 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 the quantum shot noise limit. So, here we have usual frequency and we have displacement in this case on the vertical axis. So this is on a prototype interferometer. The red curve shows, uh, uh, shows that we, uh, what the shot noise level would be when our squeeze source is turned off. And then indeed when we turn our squeeze source on, we can go below the shot noise limit. And what we do here is we have a simulated gravitational wave signal. So you can see that the signal strength is, is, stays the same but the noise goes down. So you're actually doing a better signal to noise ratio with this quantum optics technique. And here then is the apparatus that we are, are currently prepare, uh, 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 installing in the uh, LIGO Hanford uh, interferometer to do our first test of using squeeze light in a four kilometer detector. So I want to finish my talk with the last piece of, of everything that was promised that was quantum uh, mechanics on human scales. And this involves the other piece of the quantum noise that we talked about, which is the radiation pressure. So quantum noise we talked about comes in, in, uh, in two flavors, or really manifestation of the same thing. There's the shot noise, that's the square root of n limit in making a measurement. And then there is the radiation pressure noise, which is the momentum kicks back onto the measurement that we're making. So the workhorse of of the experiments that I'm going to describe to you next are optomechanical coupling. So the way that optomechanical coupling works is it's, it's if you have an optical cavity, and I already introduced the optical cavity, you have two mirrors facing each other. Now keep in mind our mirrors are free particles above their resonant frequency, so they're sort of free to move when uh, under the um, radiation pressure force. When the light beam hits the mirror, it will move. And we can use this and we can arrange the light field in these optical cavities so that we can couple this radiation pressure force strongly to the mirror motion. And I won't go into details of exactly how we do that, but there are a few different configurations that you can use in which you can do some very, very interesting things. And the, the, the one thing you can do is you can 
because the you can detune the laser frequency from the uh, resonant uh, um, resonance in the um, of the uh, cavity, and you can create an optical restoring force, and that is a very very important thing because an optical restoring force can act like a trapping potential. So it's literally what happens is the following: you have a a, a mirror, and the radiation pressure force displaces the mirror. The mirror position moves, moves by a little bit. The power in the cavity goes down uh, because the, the mirror position move, and the mirror moves back in. So it's a restoring force, and it it's, it's, uh, it's can be used. And this is a very nice way to, to uh, trap a, a, a mirror with a non-mechanical force. And I'll tell you in a moment why we're, we, that's very important. Now, the cavity does, the light in the cavity doesn't uh, respond immediately to changes in mirror position. So that time delay can give you a tamp damping force, and the damping force is used for optical cooling. So this is very much the same way as is done in, in atoms. And these are actually classical effects. You don't need quantum states of light to, to, to realize these. What you can do, however, which is a quantum effect, is when you have amplitude fluctuations of your laser light, and that drives the mirror motion. So you have your fluctuating laser field that causes your mirror to move. The mirror moves, and the light reflected from the mirror now puts that amplitude fluctuation onto the phase of the light. And that is the same. It's playing with the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. It's, it's flipping uh, 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 um, uh, noise from amplitude to phase and, and vice versa. So you can make a squeeze state inside your interferometer. Okay? So these are, and that's a quantum effect that comes about from the same optomechanical coupling. So the thing to carry away from the slightly a busy slide is you can arrange in optical cavities light fields to give you trapping forces, cooling forces, and the quantum fluctuations of the light can also cause through the mirror motion uh, for the light itself to be squeezed. So here is an experiment that's done in our laboratory. Um, we have a laser here. And what's important to follow here is this, in this purple box is an interferometer, very similar to the one I showed you for LIGO. There's a beam splitter. And then there's two mirrors facing each other, in, one in each arm of this interferometer. But notice that the end mirrors here are now these very small objects. They are instead of these, instead of the, the, the kilogram scale mirrors of LIGO, they are one gram, very small light mirrors. What the light field in here does is the light field is split into two, into two parts. Uh, 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 an intense bright field is, goes into these cavities and resonates in the, in the cavities uh, to create an, um, an optical trap. So it's an optical restoring force. And another light field that's uh, frequency offset from this one is, is used to create a damping force. So what we can do with these two light fields and by how we arrange them in these cavities is we can optically uh, trap and cool these mirrors. Okay? And the, in the process of doing that, those very same vacuum fluctuations, the fuzz ball that enters in here, will come out of this interferometer in a squeeze state because of this coupling to the mirror, where the, the, the amplitude fluctuations of the light get imprinted onto the phase. Okay. So here are now some results from, from, from these experiments. So here is a zoom in of, uh, of the one gram mirror. It's actually uh, part of a double suspension. So you can see thin glass fibers. And I wanted to uh, point out to s some of our LIGO friends who saw the fiber pulling last week. This, these fibers were pulled on the same puller. So, uh, um, so these are homemade fibers. And they're very, very important to, to maintain the uh, the, the quality factor of the mirror. So I should just tell you, this mirror has a resonant frequency around 10 hertz, and it has a, a, uh, a Q of about 1.5 million. So you poke at it, and it, it, it will ring for a few days. So we try not to poke at it. Um, and now here are the data itself. So on this axis is frequency again in hertz, and these are now centered around between uh, around a few hundred hertz, 400 to 700 hertz. And on this <coughs> uh, axis, we have displacement per bandwidth again. And what I've shown are uh, curves of the resonance. Of, and so this is a resonance that rep represents the, uh, uh, the optomechanical mode. This is the 
optical, the mechanical oscillator frequency, which is at 10 hertz, has been shifted up to 500 hertz by coupling it to the optical spring. So this is a very stiff optical trap. The way to think about this is this mechanical oscillator is attached to, to a thermal bath. And down these fibers, good as they are, comes thermal noise. So if I wanted to make a stiffer oscillator, I would say, well, let me tie it to, to a stiffer spring. But the stiffer spring would bring more thermal fluctuations. So the idea that we can decouple it from the, this, this thermal bath here and couple it strongly to a low temperature optical field, the optical field is, is, is cold, allows us to uh, optically cool and trap the mirror to the point where our mirror at this uh, coolest curve here corresponds to about just under one millikelvin. So what's going on here? We have a room temperature mirror, this, ob oops, this object sitting right here. We turn on our, our laser cooling and, 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 uh, and, and trapping beams, and we can cool this longitudinal mode of oscillation of the mirror along the optic axis down to uh, uh, just under a millikelvin. So that is what the, um, the uh, uh, cooling technique can do. I should uh, point out that if you try to do this with, with something mechanical, you couldn't do it because the thermal fluctuations would swamp you. And what this object has, this quantity n that's written in here, is the number of quanta. So there are 35,000 quanta in this, in this macroscopic grand scale object. Okay? Now keep in mind that for, for, uh, uh, typically there, there are, are, are nearly uh, 10 to the 9 quanta in these objects. So this is quite cold. And in the same experiment, we are also trying to see directly that quantum radiation pressure noise or the quantum background. And so I just wanted to plot this up here. So to get to see the quantum radiation pressure noise or the squeeze state, we would like to be at this red curve here. And our experiment is cur currently at the blue curve, which is about a factor of five away. So I want to make sure people know that we are not yet in the quantum regime. 35,000 quanta or a factor of five away is not yet quantum, but it's getting close. So I'll close with one last experiment. And that was done at the LIGO uh, observatories. And this, perhaps, is the most um, uh, macroscopic of all the macroscopic experiments. So this experiment was done at the LIGO uh, Hanford Observatory, where we tried the same techniques we have of optical cooling and trapping that we had done uh, with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the grand scale mirrors. We had to make some variations of that technique in LIGO because uh, in initial LIGO, in that phase of LIGO, these data were taken in 2007. There wasn't enough uh, uh, laser power to do, uh, do a, a pure optical cooling and trapping technique. But what you see here is the same, uh, the same um, kind of data, frequency on this axis and dis displacement uh, uh, per bandwidth on this axis. And the LIGO mirrors, this, this 10 kilogram mirror here, has a resonant frequency of just under 1 hertz. And we were able to shift out its resonance to about 150 hertz with our, our, our trapping uh, technique, and then cool it down to uh, a, a temperature in that longitudinal mode of oscillation of 1.4 microkelvin. So 1.4 microkelvin, a kilogram scale object sitting at room temperature uh, trapped and cooled to 1.4 microkelvin, and that corresponds to 200 quanta. So this macroscopic object is cooled down to about 200 quanta. And uh, to keep in mind, when n reaches 1, that, that's, that's where at the quantum ground state of this kilogram scale object. So let me finish by tel telling you what the outlook is. So advanced LIGO construction has begun, and we, are, we, we expect that, uh, that uh, it will return uh, detection of, of cosmic signals with, with rates that could be several per year. Um, and as far as if you're an astrophysicist, this is, this is exciting because it's turning on a, 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 a new sense, if you will, you know, from sight to hearing. It's an analogy I already made. The other th thing I wanted to you to take away is that quantum optics techniques are now deployed in gravitational wave detectors. 
I showed you the data of how we reduce the shock noise limit with uh, injection of, of squeeze states. And in fact, we're going to, uh, we're trying, uh, uh, we're testing this out in a four kilometer detector uh, as we speak. And finally, on the question of macroscopic quantum measurement science, um, I want you uh, uh, to take away that we have these strong optomechanical couplings where we can do optical cooling and trapping of, of mirrors that in my lab now we would work with um, micrograms, grams, and then of course LIGO is kilograms. So we have a, a wide range of, of, of mass scales on which we're doing macroscopic um, uh, quantum measurement uh, science. We are within a factor of a few of this quantum limit in laboratory experiments. And I want to close with, with reminding people that advanced LIGO is going to operate at the scan standard quantum limit. If you remember when I showed you the advanced LIGO curve, I showed you the dashed line that crossed it. So advanced LIGO will have mirrors, kilogram scale, 40 kilogram um, uh, mirrors that will be in the quantum ground state. So it, shall, it should open up for us the ability to do uh, quantum mechanics on really unprecedented size scales. So my cast of characters, I have an incredible group of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, postdocs and graduate students who have uh, contributed to uh, all, all, all the work in, in my group. Uh, I get a lot of support and, and, uh, um, uh, from the LIGO laboratory. Um, my collaborators at Caltech and, and, uh, and elsewhere, and of course, the National Science Foundation. Thank you.